Hey, what's up guys? This is Dr. Vivek Palipuram bringing you the next lecturette in ECP 170. In this lecturette, I'm going to demonstrate to you how to write MIPS codes with functions. So let's take a look. So this is the C code that I'll be converting to MIPS. So take some time and carefully look into this particular code here. It's a, it's a simple code which performs uh, some mathematical manipulations. So here I have my int main. Uh, there's a variable called initial that has been initialized to zero. Then I set initial to init array and I pass array and 10 as arguments to this function. And then once I return back from this function, I perform this printf statement. And then finally the main exits. Let's take a look into the init array function. So init array function is something like this. I have my variable i, i set to one. And in this for loop, i goes all the way to size, i plus plus, and i set array of i minus one to part two of i, and then i finally return one from this function. The par function returns the power to the two. So what it does is it, it returns you num to the power of two. So essentially num times num. So overall, this code isn't doing a whole lot of useful stuff but I think this example will be quite useful for us to understand how functions in MIPS should be written carefully. So I have not written a solution for this code just yet. So I'm going to demonstrate to you in live how to write codes in MIPS assembly. And along the way, I may make some errors, which you may catch it even before I do, but it will be quite useful for us so that you do not make those mistakes, which I am about to make. Yeah, while I convert this C code to MIPS assembly. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started as to how to convert this C code to MIPS assembly. So let me adjust my video or my terminals appropriately. Okay. Okay. File. I'll open a new window so that I can write my MIPS codes here. Okay. So let me name my assembly file as example.asm. So I will use my favorite editor, which happens to be Vim. Vim example.asm. Okay. Before I proceed any further, it's always a good idea to use a stub for your respective code. So let's let's let me use a, a really good stub right here. So this stub will be as follows: uh, dot global main. It starts with dot global main, and then followed by the main function. That's my main function. This main function should end with a syscall. So this call, so that's where my main function ends. So let me put a nice comment here that main ends here. And here I have my dot data section where I'll declare all the memory variables that I'll be using inside of my code. So let's say that I have all these variables. Some of them will be in the dot data section. Some of them may not be in the dot data section. Array is definitely an, a memory variable here because arrays are stored in the main memory. So let's declare array as dot space 40 bytes because I need to create an array for 10 integers. I need to create an array for 10 integers. So that's that's that. Uh, let's see if there's anything else that I need. I do need a message to print in my code. So message dot ASCII Z and that message will be slash in status status is that okay and other than that I do not have any other printing that is going on okay now before I proceed any further let me just take a quick look into this C code as to what functions I need to implement main will be implemented for sure I need to also implement init array and I need to implement this function called pop so let me also create stub for these functions as well. So let me create individual stub for these functions. Uh, so this one will be 
for let's say pop pop function goes here and then I will have my init array init array function goes here init function goes here okay now remember the callee has to do quite a bit of important activities with the stack specifically the callee has to save the s registers that have been used by its caller it has to definitely save the ra register onto the stack and then prior to return just before executing jrra the callee needs to pop those registers off of the stack so let me put a nice comment for myself here uh, paw function paw2 is going to start here so that's my label for paw2 push s regist registers used by caller and I also need to push RA. Let me be a defensive coder here and let me just push RA register here itself. So add I dollar dollar SP comma dollar SP comma negative four. So this is to adjust stack pointer and then I'll store word dollar RA zero dollar SP. Okay. So that's my RA register that has been safely stashed onto the stack, safely stored onto the stack. Then do function stuff, do function stuff here, and then followed by, I need to pop RA register first because it's the last one to get in. So add I, or rather first, well, pop is opposite of pushing. So first I need to retrieve the value. So load word into RA, zero dollar SP, and I'll add I dollar SP comma dollar SP comma four. So stack pointer is adjusted. Now I need to pop S registers in opposite order. So I need to pop the S registers in the opposite order. Let me also set, well, line numbers here. It's better. Okay. After the S registers are popped, it's safe to return. So JR dollar RA. So this is how I'm going to return from the function. If you notice, all of these functions usually, or most of the functions usually have the same stuff that can be used, right? Right now, this is just an empty function. So I can reuse this code and put it for init array function as well. So let me just copy some of these lines real quick. And here will be my init, init array function. There you go. So I push s registers onto the stack. I adjust the stack pointer, store RA. I do function stuff. I load RA register first and then adjust the stack pointer. Just pay careful attention to how you're adjusting your stack pointer. You know. If, you were to, if I were to do something like this, I could have run into a problem. So make sure that you're doing proper arithmetic with your stack pointers. Most of the times, students run into errors because they did not manipulate stack pointer appropriately. So my function stub is ready. So these are my empty functions for now. For now. now let's go ahead and, and, in, and uh, start coding for main. Before I start coding for main, let me create a nice register map. Register map. In this register map, I have a variable initial, so I'll say that initial is a zero. Initial is a zero. Let's see if I need any other registers here. Well, not, not any important registers uh, as far as I can tell. Okay, so first, initial is set to zero, and let me formally introduce you the li instruction. Load immediate instruction is going to load a register with an immediate value. So I'll load immediate to $s0, the value zero. So initial is equal to zero. Initial is set to zero. Next, I need to call this function. Call function. Now, if you notice, main is not using any of the T registers. Neither is it using its own argument registers. So I do not have to store them onto the stack and I can safely set my argument registers for the init array function and I can proceed ahead and I can call that function. So I need the address 
of the array. That's the very first argument. And then I need to pass this argument 10 to this function. So let me use the argument registers. A0, A0 will be array address and A1 will be constant 10. So first let's get the array address. Load address, load address into dollar a0, the array address. So now a0 is the address of the first location. So that's the address of the first location. Then I need to set the second argument as 10. So load immediate to dollar a1, the value 10. So second arg is ready here. Second argument is ready. Now that the arguments are ready, now I can call this function jal init array. jal init array. So call function. So I called my function. After return back from this function, after I return back from this function, initial should store the return value. Usually v0 and v1 registers are used for return value, starting with v0. So at this point, at this point, I would assume that I'll assume that return value is in v0 register. So I will assume that return value is in v0 register. So here in this case, initial is set to the return value. So I need to move the contents from v0 register into the register for initial, which is s0. So I can do something like this. Move into dollar s0 the value of dollar v0 so that's another instruction that you can use the move instruction instead of doing all the arithmetic operations to perform the initializations let me introduce some of more instructions that you could use and possibly reduce the length of your code as well so move instruction is another instruction which is used to move the value from one register to the other the first argument is always the destination register and the second argument is the source register so this gets return uh, this gets return value in initial variable so that's what this fun this um, this instruction does so i have done that next i need to print the statement printf slash n status colon space and i have already created that message here that message here. So first, before I print the value, I need to print this message status slash in status is status colon. So let's let me print that item, the message. So I'll put my for myself a comment. Print message first. So let me print that message. So to print this message, let me take a real quick look at the example code. So I went to lab 10's web page um, and I looked up at example2 underscore hello world dot ASM because I almost never remember the codes for all the printf statements and whatnot. So let me use that. So to in order to print a string, I first need to load v0 with value 4. So load to v0 the value 4 and then a0 register gets a0 register gets the address of the string so load address into dollar a0 message just to make sure that's how i name the message yes it is msg not monosodium glutamate but message so that's msg and then i perform a syscall so that would print that message Next, I need to print the integer. Hmm. So example two does not have printing an int. So let me take a look into another example. Maybe example three underscore io dot asm. Input, output, arithmetic may help me out. Okay, let's see how we can do that. Okay, so in order to print an integer, print int, I need to load the register v0 with value 1. Then a0 register gets the value that needs to be printed. 
initial uh, i need to print initial and initial is a zero register so i'll move to dollar a zero dollar a zero so initial to be to be to be printed initial to be printed and then i can perform my syscall so that would have printed the value and then finally main ends here the main ends so that's your main function now let's take a look at init array function now we have already passed arguments to init function inside of the main so it's time for us to start modifying the init function before we, I, before we do that let me take a really quick look from top from the bottom inside of the main so a0 is array a1 is 10 I jal to init array I'll assume that init would place its return value in v0 um, move to a0 v0 value so initial gets a return value I print message first then I print the number itself and then I finally end okay the function ends now comes the init register or edit array function now comes the init array function so the first things first I need to push as registers used by the caller so main function was calling the init array function so let me go back into my main function to see which registers I was using inside of main so the registers that I was using inside of main the s registers uh, I have used as zero and that's pretty much it I just use as zero so that's great I don't have to push a whole lot so what I will do is I'll push a zero register first things first in order to push I adjust the stack pointer make pay careful attention to stack pointer arithmetic that you're performing so adjust SP and then I'll store word I'll store word dollar as zero zero dollar SP so that's your base offset addressing in action okay let me also pop s register here I need to pop the s register so load word dollar s zero zero dollar sp and add i dollar sp dollar sp comma dollar sp comma four so I popped it and then I return all right jr is for return jump register jump return or rather jump register okay as I as it turns out I was modifying my pop function instead of init function okay I was modifying pop function instead of init uh, I really don't want to delete it let's assume that I'll use a zero register inside of init array function so that a zero will be pushed anyway I should have been modifying the s0 register uh, the init array function so I will add I to dollar SP comma dollar SP comma negative four and store word dollar s0 zero dollar SP so s0 is stored and then I need to pop it off so I'll pop it load word dollar s0 zero dollar SP add I dollar SP dollar SP comma four okay so the register is popped so that's my init function init function needs to store the s0 register because its caller main was using a zero register so pushed a zero because main used it okay now let's see what's happening inside of this init array function inside of this init array function the first argument is the array which is in a0 the second argument is size which is in a1 so let me put a note again one more time for myself a0 a0 is array and a1 is size is the variable size that these are the arguments um, let me create a quick reg map here the register map and that would be dollar s0 dollar dollar s0 is i 
$s0si. Okay, now first things first. Inside of this function, I, I have my for loop, so I should officially begin my for loop. So for, that's the label for, i is set to 1. I can perform that initialization before this for loop actually starts officially. So i is set to 1, mm. so I will do add i to dollar, well, you know what, I'll just use li instruction, li dollar s0 comma 1. So i is equal to 1 for for loop. Inside of this for loop, inside of this for loop, I first check the condition because your for loop is an entry controlled loop, all right? For loop is an entry controlled loop. So I have to check the condition prior to executing anything inside of my for loop. Similarly, while loop is also an entry control loop. Do while loop is an exit control loop, which checks the condition prior to exiting the loop. P please pay careful attention to how loops or when the loops check these conditions. For for loops, always check the condition first. So I need to check if i is less than or equal to size. If i is less than or equal to size, I can go ahead and execute the contents of this for loop. Otherwise, I need to exit. So let me set up the exit condition here. The opposite of less than or equal to is greater than, strictly greater than, mind you. So if i is strictly greater than size, then I will exit this loop. So I can do something like this, bgt, if i, if i is strictly greater than size, which happens to be the a1 register, a1 register, I'll go to, I'll exit this loop. So let me say outside for. And here is outside for. That's the outside for label. Make sure that you define your labels. Otherwise, otherwise, I will go ahead and perform this operation, array of i minus 1 is equal to paw 2 times i. So first, I need to call this function paw 2 times i. I need to use this fun call this function paw 2 times i. Now, this time around, init array is the caller. Init array is the caller. Should it use any of the T registers or the or its own A registers, it needs to store them onto the stack prior to calling this function. Init array function is not using any of the T registers, so that does not have to be stored. However, it is definitely using its own argument registers, specifically A0 and A1. So I need to store A0 and A1 onto the stack. So I'll say push A0 and A1 to stack because init array itself is using them as its arguments. I don't want it to be overwritten. So I can say something like this. Uh, first, I'll adjust the stack pointer and I dollar $sp, dollar $sp comma negative four. So I adjust sp, I adjust sp, and then I'll store word dollar a0 to zero dollar sp. So a0 is stashed. Similarly, I'll again adjust the stack pointer, adjust the stack pointer, and I'll store word dollar a1 zero dollar sp using the base offset addressing. So a0 and a1 have been pushed onto the stack. Now that they have been pushed onto the stack, now I can use them. Use a0, a1 as args. I'm free to use them. Notice that paw takes in just one argument. It just takes one, it takes one argument. So I really didn't have to push a1, but it's a good practice to do that, all right? I know it's a couple of lines more code, but it's a safe coding practice with respect to MIPS. MIPS, can, MIPS codes can really get long too soon and you may be lost if you have not committed your code properly. For safety, be a, be, a, uh, be a defensive coder. So I save both A0 and A1 onto the stack. So next, I need to use or prepare args for the paw function. So let me put a comment, prep args for paw2. So A0 needs to be set to I i is a s0 register so move to dollar a0 the value s0 so that is uh passed i i passed i as an argument i passed i as an argument 
Next, after I passed i as an argument, I'll call this function. So I will jal, I'll jal, I'll jal to paw2. After I return back from paw2 function, after I return back, I need to retrieve the stack, the values that were pushed onto the stack. So retrieve a0 and a1. Because I would like init array to be able to use those registers now. The push, the pop operation is opposite of pushing. So first I will load word into dollar $a1, zero dollar $sp, and I will adjust the stack pointer. So I adjusted the stack pointer. Let me apply some sh shortcuts here because I don't want to spend too much time typing. So the next one is zero. Okay. So I have retrieved a zero, a one and a zero from the stack. Now that I have retrieved them, the return value, I assume that it will be in the V register. So return val must be in V zero. If return value is in V zero register, I can just use it and to put the value in array of i. So now I need to compute array of i, the address array of i, so that I can use base offset addressing mode to put the array at array of i. So now get address of array of i minus one. I need to put the value at array of i minus one, not array of i. So first, uh, let me do that. So I can use my, I cannot use S register anymore, S zero anymore. So let me use um, S one register. Let me use S one register here to compute the address of array of I minus one. First, I need to compute I minus one. So add I to dollar S one, the variable I is S zero comma negative one. So I have computed i minus one first. After this, I'm going to compute four times i. I'm going to compute four times i. So you need to perform i minus one first because the correct offset in bytes is four times in parentheses i minus one. In the in-class participation problems, I have seen this error where students first perform four times i and then they subtracted a one or a two from, uh, from the offset. That is incorrect. First, I need to get i minus one and then multiply that to by four. So now I'll do that uh, to dollar s1, dollar s1, comma, dollar s1. So this is, this is two times i minus one. And then finally, I'll do it one more time. Add to dollar s1, dollar s1, comma, dollar s1. So now it is four times i minus one, which you actually need. Now that I have computed proper address uh, or rather proper offset in bytes, I need to add it to the base address to get the target location or the address of the target location array of i minus one. So I will add, I can reuse s1 register itself. I will use the reuse the dollar s1 register. Dollar a0 is the address dollar a0 is the address of the array dollar a0 is the first argument which is the address of the array comma dollar s1 so now i have gotten ampersand of array of i minus one okay let me save this code now that i have gotten the address I will use the base offset addressing to store the value, the return value at array of i minus one. So I will do store word, return value is v0. Since I am already at my target location, so the constant offset will be zero dollar s1. So now array of i minus one is equal to return value. It's equal to the return value. I need to comment this line. Uh, 
Okay, so the return value is stored. Next, inside of this for loop, I need to increment my i counter. So i and i dollar s zero dollar s zero comma one. So that is my i plus plus. After incrementing the counter, I need to jump back to for loop. So jump for. Yes, that's jump for. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Now I'll code outside for next. Outside for. Outside for nothing is happening. I'm setting or I'm rather returning a value negative, uh, returning of a value one. So return values are usually in V0 register. And that's the usual agreement between the different functions across function calls. First argument, first return value will be placed in V0, second will be in V1, and that's the extent to it. So I'll load immediate dollar V0 with value one. So that's my return value. So that's my return value. And then I'm preparing to return from this function by popping the RA and S0 registers. Okay, so that's your, that's your um, init array function. So that's our init array function. So let's take a quick look one more time. So init array, it's saved as zero register. And we used as zero as a counter for the for loop. Uh, the counter, if, if counter is greater than, is, if it is strictly greater than size, then I'll go outside for. I need to store the A registers because A0 A and A1 are arguments array and size respectively, respectively for init array function. So I don't want them to be modified or destroyed inadvertently, so I save them. I prepare for the function call. First, I need to prepare the arguments for pot 2 It just takes one argument, which is i. So that's that. And then I, uh, once I return back from this function, I retrieve my argument registers. Return value must be in v0 that needs to be placed in array of i minus one. So first I prepare the proper offset. So, I, so first I perform i minus one, then perform two times i minus one, then four times i minus one. I use uh, four times i minus one as my offset in bytes added to the base address, which is an A0 register, and S1 holds the target address of array of i minus one. Then I use the base offset addressing mode to store V0 at that particular location. I increment my i counter, I jump back to four. Okay, that's my outside four. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so init array is done. Init array is ready. I need to now code paw two, which is num times num. So let's go back, going back to the paw function now. This is my paw function, so I will do my function stuff right here. So let's do the function stuff right here. I need to perform num times num. Num was the argument to paw two. By convention, a zero register is the first argument. Num is a zero in this case. Just like how a zero is array in init array and a one is size in, in, in init array function. Num is a zero in this case. Now this function is not calling anything, so I don't have to worry too much about the stack. Everything has been set up before I started putting the code inside of these functions. So that's the benefit of using the stub, even for the functions. So I need to return num times num. So I need to return num times num. Let's see how I can do num times num. Okay, I may have shot myself in the foot here. 
let's see what is the best way to perform num times num so I can use a register make it store num and then multiply two registers that have the same value num and and get num times num I can get like that so I need to actually use the mod instruction so let me actually go uh, to MIPS instruction set page in ECP 170's web page to see how mul can be used. This time I have to break rules and <laughs> use the mul instruction now. Okay, so I'll use the mul instruction. So I'll use T0 register. I have my T registers to spare. I will use T0 register to store an instance of num. So move to dollar $T0, dollar $A0. So now T0 is equal to num. Next, I need to perform num times num. T0 stores num, A0 stores num. So if I multiply both of these guys, I'll get num times num, which I need to return ultimately. So I will use the instruction mul. So there you go. I'm officially introducing, to, introducing you to this instruction mul. The first argument is going to be the destination register. Then you have the two operands. So this performs num times num. So v0 that needs to be returned will store num times one. And then I'll return back from this function, which I have already set up already. So that's your paw function. So in summary, here's what I did. I first created my main function stub. Then I created individual stubs for my individual functions. I put comments to guide me what's, what I need to do in these, uh, in these functions. By setting up the stub for functions is going to help you a lot. It's going to help you to perform coding in a smoother manner, in my opinion. Always make sure that your caller is saving either saving the T registers and or the argument registers should it use them actively. In my case, I had to store the A registers when I was writing the init function because it was using A, uh, A registers actively. The callee, however, should store those registers that have been used by its direct caller. So A0 was used by the main function, so I stored init array, uh, I had init array store a zero onto the stack. Similarly, init array was using a zero register actively, so I had paw2 store a zero register onto the stack. Please make a note that callee should always store the array register. It should always back up the array register. I think it's a safe defensive coding practice. So let's give this function or this code a try and see what happens. Now, if you're curious about the values that need that need to be printed or that, that should be in these locations, they should uh, be something like this. So let me just modify real quick this C program itself just to show you what values need to be printed. Okay, so let me just compile this code one more time. Okay, so there's a small syntax error somewhere, it's on line four. Ah, uh, okay. There you go. Okay, so the values that need to be stored are uh, 1, 4, 9, 16, basically the square of these numbers that need to go there, starting from 1 all the way to 100. And that should, that, that should typically be my result, or that should be viewed in the data segment of my code. So now let me open the QT SPIM simulator and load this example.
let me save it one more time so that's saved let's wait for the qt swim simulator to open up okay i'll re reload and initialize so the code is in this particular one right here if I click open and if there's a syntax error in my code, Qt Spim is going to yell at me. So let's see if it yells at me. It didn't. Okay. Now you can see here, this is your user text segment. So your code is right here. If everything goes fine, your code should finally halt at this location where I perform a syscall after loading v0 with value 10. So hit, let me press run and continue. Status is one. Status is one, and yes, indeed, my code has stopped here. This wasn't supposed to be printed in my original code, status is one. So let's take a look into the data section and how the data section looks like. It should have values 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100. Let me make sure my data segment is in decimal. My registers are also in decimal, that's fine. So that's my data segment, and you can see here these values. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, and 100. So that's perfect. So that's perfect. Everything has gone properly in my code the very first single time. I hope you guys enjoyed this demonstration and you guys hopefully may have picked some tips and techniques that you can use in your own coding to make your code faster. Some common tips include making sure that you have your even the main stub as well as the function stub ready have them in place make sure to have your callee save the s registers used by its immediate caller please actively put comments in your code they are going to guide you a lot so if you look into my code if you look into my mips code i strived to comment almost each and every line of my code and to be very frank it was not that tedious some of the lines are not commented, but that's okay. For example, here, I'm trying to print a message. So I do not have to necessarily comment these lines. You don't have to go crazy and start commenting each and every line of the code. But wherever you have your logic placed, please try to put comments there because it's the users that make errors with their code when they're trying to implement their logic. So this level of commenting will be very acceptable when you provide your solutions to us. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecturette. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecturette uh, and let us know if you have any questions. Please let me know if you uh, had any trouble viewing or understanding this particular example. The key is to revisit the videos over and over again and try to understand how MIPS coding is. It's actually quite fun. It's, it's very much fun. I, I love MIPS coding. So I'll sign out here. Have a great day.